Sing to God, sing praises to God, let the hearts of all who seek God rejoice. Good morning, and welcome to the worship of God for College Hill Presbyterian Church. No matter who you are, no matter where you are on life's journey, whether you're here in the room or part of the online congregation, we are delighted to welcome you to this service of worship today. If you are new or newer to College Hill Presbyterian Church, we want you to know about some of the great stuff going on in the life of this congregation. And we communicate in a lot of ways, but one of them is the e-news, our weekly digest of all the programs, events, and activities. If you're not receiving that, you should be. Email me, pastor at collegehillpc.org, and I will get you connected. We want you to know because we want you to come along with us as we grow together in love. Got some housekeeping things to go over on this 13th of August. Please note that after the service today, I am on vacation for a week. Uh, that means no Tuesday morning Bible study this week. 
I will be back the following week, which must be the math is hard, 22nd of August. Bible study will resume. Uh, it's so great to have Linda Chen here for the second week of a three week engagement. Welcome back. Always, always a pleasure. Um, do note, this is the last Sunday during which there's no jam or roots during this service. Children are welcome to stay in the service. Of course, we don't have any programs for them. The nursery is open. Calvin is there. I'm sure he would love some company, but you do you. Um, the flowers in the chancel are given to God's glory and in loving memory of David Schaeferman from Jean Ann on their 51st wedding anniversary. Jean Ann told me last week she wouldn't be here today. She's with her daughter, which makes sense. But we have the beautiful flowers to celebrate that important milestone. Now, you have shown up for a day that is not like other days. Oh no, it's AMA Sunday at College Hill Presbyterian Church. AMA stands for Ask Me Anything. Instead of me preaching a sermon where I just talk about what I think I should talk about, you are in the driver's seat. I am soliciting questions. And if you haven't participated, it's not too late. You've got from now until the start of the service. There are writing implements and index cards right here. There are more in the back, on the back pew on the piano side. And I will collect index cards from all of you at the beginning of the sermon time. I already have some questions that people have sent in by email. It can be anonymous, and yes, it can be anything that you want to ask. So do not let this opportunity go to waste. It's AMA Sunday. But before we get to have that fun, we get to be together in the presence of God. So if you're worshiping online, the whole bulletin's right there on the website. If you're here in the room, I would refer you to the front of it where you'll find our call to worship. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon God's name. Sing to God, sing praises to God. Glory in God's holy name, let the hearts of all who seek God rejoice. Come, let us worship God.
Let us pray. Living God, for the love that came before us and is all around us and orders our steps, for the love that got us out of bed this morning and sent us on our way, for the love that is poured out and running over, for the love all around us, we give you thanks. In this time of worship, draw us nearer to one another, draw us nearer to you. May this time change us that we might be the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ in a hurting world. In Christ's name we pray, amen. The living God loves us, and the living God wants a lot from us, more than we often manage to produce. But God is always calling us back, forgiving us, renewing us, Trusting in God's great love for us, let us join in our prayer of confession. God, we know that in love you seek to save us, and we know that we too often turn away. Forgive our failure to welcome your love and walk in your way. Heal our hardened hearts and open us to all that you will do. Hear us now as we confess in the silence of our hearts. Now hear the good news. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love for us. As far as the east is from the west, so far does God remove our transgressions from us. Beloved, let us believe the good news of the gospel in Christ. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. I'm going to invite any children in the room to come meet me on the chancel steps. I'm going to do this a little differently this morning. Good morning. Ah, nice, 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 nice. A very good morning to you. How's everybody doing this morning? Yeah? I want to ask what I hope will be a very easy question. Do any of you have brothers or sisters? Okay, almost all of us, one only child, that's all, that's okay, interesting, interesting. Now let me ask you this, those of you 
who have brothers and sisters, do you always get along with your brothers and sisters all the time? Do you sometimes have fights with, yes. You have a baby sister, so not a lot of fights there yet. That's good. That's good. What, when you get into arguments with the brother or a sister, what kinds of things might it be about? What to do next, how to do things. What to do next, how to do things. Those are really big. What else? What do you want to play? What do you want to play? And you might have a disagreement about that. Are there other things? As you know, we have a little two, almost three-year-old in our house. And so he likes to fight with his brother and sister about sharing. He does not like to share anything. And if you have it, he wants it, and he will make that known. So, you know, it's normal for brothers and sisters to fight. We're going to hear a story from the Bible this morning about Joseph. Joseph was the youngest of a whole big bunch of brothers. He had 11 brothers, and they all picked on him and bullied him and didn't like him very much. How do you think that made Joseph feel? Sad. Joseph felt very sad. And we're going to hear in the story about some sad things that happened to Joseph because his brother was mean. His brothers were mean. But you know what Joseph did? He loved his brothers. Even though they were mean, he kept loving them. And eventually, and I mean like a long time later, when they were all grown up, his brothers said they were sorry. When we remember that God loves us, we can love brothers and sisters even when they're not very nice to us. I want you to remember that this week. We're going to do a quick repeat after me prayer before you go back to your grown up. So repeat after me. Dear God, thank you. Thank you that you love us. Even when we fight with brothers and sisters, help us remember your love and show it to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Great job. Thank you so much. And you can go back to your grown-up now. Find the person who brought you to church. Our first reading comes from Genesis chapter 37, the first four verses and then jumping to 12 and 28, which means we miss a couple of plot points. The Joseph story is about as close to a novel as you get in the book of Genesis, so if you want to catch up on what happens in between, you can turn to page 34 in the Pew Bible. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children because he was the son of his old age, and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. 
he came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. The man asked him, what are you seeking? I'm seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. The man said, they have gone away, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered them out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead, with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Here ends this reading. Our second reading, our second reading comes from the book of Romans, chapter 10, verses 5 through 13. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified. One confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here ends this reading of scripture. May God help us to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. AMA is going to work like this. I've got questions already that were submitted by email and just grabbed a couple off the Zoom chat. Anybody have anything they want to add? To the plate. Thank you. Okay. Any others? And, uh, you know, we're going to mix them up just to make sure that I haven't planted anything or doing anything too tricky here. Shuffle the deck. In case you're the anxious type, it is 9.55. I'm setting an alarm on my phone for 10 after 10. <laughs> Let us pray. May the words of my lips, the meditation of all our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 
Okay. First question. Ah, what is my favorite local food fair? I'm going to try, so a dirty trick would be to take a question like this and just filibuster for 15 minutes, right? <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I'm going to gross you out. I'll be fast. Uh, living in Iowa for 15 years, and I grew up in Blair County, believe it or not, I really missed Scrapple. And I went through a, a phase when we moved back here, let's just say was not approved by my cardiologist. I, I, I think I got it out of my system, but... Uh, it's not, and along with that, this may be a cliche, but um, I maintain, you can quote me on this, I maintain that any town in Pennsylvania with a population of a thousand or more has better pizza than the entire state of Iowa. <laughs> That's a fact. That is a fact. And I mean, it's not, it's not been great for my waistline, but being back and the scrapple and pizza eating part of the world uh, has really improved morale for me. Next question. How do you balance family life, spouse, your relationship with God while being uh, a two pastor family? Uh, poorly, sometimes. I mean, I, I think that this is one that, that calls for some honesty insofar as I do not feel like I've cracked the code. I remember when Mary Beth and I got engaged, I was on a retreat for young ministers back when I used to be a young minister. I had a colleague who was a United Methodist clergy person married to another United Methodist clergy person, and I said, is this going to work? Does this work for you? And she said, we have dinner together every night. It's often at 10 p.m., but we do. And I think to the extent that we are able to fit in all the things that we want to fit in, it has a lot to do with thinking outside of the box and embracing some of the flexibility that ministerial work affords us. One thing I really appreciate about being a minister is it can be a lot of work, but I also feel like I have a lot of freedom to shape my schedule, right? If I have to do something in the middle of the day, I can work in the evening after the kids have gone to bed. Uh, all of that said, I would say that work-life balance is a constant struggle and not something that I would hold myself up as uh, someone to emulate or somebody who's figured it out. Uh, I think I'm somebody who's still very much working. Is it a creek or is it a crick? <laughs> it's a crick. Go Stillers. Oh, oh, I like this one. Okay, do we feel like we're seeing enough of a trend in younger members for optimism about where College Hill Presbyterian Church will be five or 10 years from now? Absolutely yes. I will try to do this quick because this is something I can talk about a lot. It's really important. If College Hill Presbyterian Church is your primary experience of church, you don't get out much, church wise. You may not realize what it's like out there. Mainline Protestant churches, Presbyterian, United Methodist, Episcopalian, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, Reformed Church in America, United Church of Christ, American Baptist, that family of denominations that had historically been at the center of American life have been losing money and members since the year 1960, more or less. And uh, there's new research suggesting that that decline intensified during COVID, that the last couple of years tipped things over the edge in a bad way. Lots of churches like ours are hurting. 
given that, the way, the, the, the number of young families who are finding their way to this church, who are touched by the ministries that you all support, is nothing short of phenomenal. I'm always, I feel awkward talking about it, but it's not about me. It's about your support. It's about our fantastic faith formation staff and volunteers who are willing to work hard and think outside of the box and have a church that supports them in it. So in terms of drawing new people, drawing younger people, the fact that younger people are significantly involved in the life and leadership of this church right now, not the future, the present, as it were. As it were. I feel really good about it, but there's one caveat. We have to keep supporting the things that work for young families. And those aren't always the things that more established members want. There's an author and congregational consultant named Sarah Rice. She used to work for the Alban Institute. Now she's with, I think it's called Congregational Consulting. Uh, Sarah Rice says, churches that are thriving in this day and age are churches in which the more established members are willing to support things they do not understand. Let me say that again. The churches that are thriving are the ones where established members are willing to support things they do not understand for the sake of younger folks. I have seen tremendous willingness to operate that way in the time that I've been here. If that continues, we're going to do very, very well by the grace of God. All right, let's keep moving. What is my favorite book? Oh, wow. That's like asking me to choose between my children. Um, ugh. Can I have two? Can I cheat and have two favorite books? Is that, and there are more than this, but I'm thinking about influence on me. You all know that I was raised in very conservative evangelical Christianity. And I went to Messiah University and studied religion and ended up having a really transformational experience there. And one of the moments that I can point to is when Dr. Susie Stanley, a wonderful professor who died not that long ago, assigned a book in a theology seminar that I was taking uh, by Luke Timothy Johnson entitled The Real Jesus the real Jesus. It was his response to the trendiness of the Jesus Seminar. If you remember the Jesus Seminar, Marcus Borg, John Dominic Crossan, uh, Burton Mack, a group of New Testament scholars who were really good at getting headlines back in the 90s for claiming to uncover the real historical Jesus. Um, and in that book, Luke Timothy Johnson laid out an argument that I'd never encountered before. He said that these Jesus Seminar guys, and they are mostly guys, are a lot like Christian fundamentalists because they both say that what matters about the Bible is the history that you can reconstruct from reading it. The fundamentalists say it's all eyewitness accounts and just straight historical narration the Jesus Seminar folks said, no, you have to use detective work and dig in and say, this part is myth, this part's historical, but they're both obsessed with the past. Luke Timothy Johnson is a New Testament scholar, a good one. He's also a Roman Catholic. In that book, he says, the real Jesus is the risen Christ who meets us now in worship and prayer, in the life of the church. And the text bears witness to the risen one. So it's not about going down all these historical cul-de-sacs and dead ends. It's about bearing witness to the risen Christ right here, right now. I encountered that at a time in my life when I really needed it. The other book that I'll mention here, uh, Anna Carter Florence's Preaching is Testimony. 
I wrote my doctor of ministry thesis on that book and its applicability to the congregation that I was serving. And when it came time for the oral defense of my doctor of ministry thesis, uh, the main point of criticism that I received was that my thesis was less a work of critical scholarship and more a gushing fanboy love letter to Anna Carter Florence. They weren't wrong. Real quick, Anna Carter Florence talks about the fact that we live in a time where authority has become a contested subject for preachers. It's the year 2023, and if I stand up here and say, the PCUSA teaches, or the creed says, or even the Bible says, a lot of people aren't just going to take that on my authority. Those days are gone. We need a different way for a preacher to connect to people. And she talks about testimony as the process of the preacher going to the text, looking for God, coming back to the people and saying, here's what I hear. Here's what I see. Part of what she does in the book is a little historical study of how that approach enabled the preaching of women in times and places in this country when churches were not authorized the preaching of women. And it's this different and I believe more powerful way to connect text and God and people. Uh, that book was transformational for me. And I'm constantly recommending it to people. Okay. How are the two biblical readings picked each week? And should we, how should we understand their relationship to one another? That's really good. Uh, we follow the revised common lectionary, which is a schedule. There's actually four readings appointed for every Sunday. We typically get three of them. Two of the readings and the call to worship will almost always come from the psalm appointed for the day. Now, the, the revised common lectionary is based on the lectionary our Roman Catholic friends follow. But it's tweaked, so it doesn't include books that Roman Catholics regard as scripture, but Protestants typically do not, like the Wisdom of Solomon, or that sort of thing. But what that means is that we are reading the same texts today as our Christian siblings here in Easton, and in Pennsylvania, and the nation, and all around the world. So it helps to foster Christian unity. We're all reading the same stuff. We let the Roman Catholics take the lead on that because they've got the most adherents. Uh, with what? A uh, billion with a B, Roman Catholics in the world right now. But then we adapt it to suit our needs. As far as a relationship between the two readings, sometimes there's a really explicit one. Other times, not so much. This summer, as you've been as, you, as you've experienced, we've got continuous readings from Genesis and continuous readings from Romans, just going through those two. So any connection between them is largely serendipitous or coincidental. But other times, and especially seasons like Advent and Lent, the lectionary will put passages together that they believe are related and that shed light on one another. There are some preachers who will explicitly draw those out. I don't love preaching on more than one text at a time. It's not how I was trained. It's not how I think. So I don't often do that. Sometimes there's a connection. Sometimes there is not. Ten after, I'm going to do one more. I'll do one more. Oh, boy. I shouldn't have done one more. Um, tell us more about predestination. <laughs> That was in the Zoom chat, actually. So you came and, bl came and blamed somebody who's in the room. Uh, the timer went off, so you just, I can do this in, in a minute and a half. Uh, you watch me. Predestination, the idea that God picks some people to be saved and some people to be a reprobate, and it happens before you're born, and there's nothing you can do about it. That teaching is associated with John Calvin 
We looked, and, and Huldrych Zwingli and Martin Luther, these, these key figures in the Protestant Reformation, and Zwingli and Calvin are our theological founding fathers. But, but, that teaching uh, was tweaked significantly in the work of Karl Barth. And actually, I'm going to cheat here. I have already addressed this in a, a podcast that I appeared on recently that's linked on uh, the church's Facebook page. And I give my, basically I just talk about art in my answer, and the real quick and dirty version of it is this. Calvin thought individual people were chosen by God. Bart says, uh-uh, no, one person is chosen. Jesus Christ is the one chosen by God. He alone is chosen to stand under God's judgment on our behalf, that's the cross, and he alone is chosen for life in partnership with God. Just him, nobody else. What I love about that is it takes the focus off of me and puts it where it belongs, on my Savior. Want to hear more? Check out the podcast. But I believe uh, this time has come to, and that went by quickly. So uh, thank you for participating, and maybe we'll do, oh, that's really not necessary. <laughs> Let's continue in worship, please. Please join me in our affirmation of faith taken this week from the Belhar Confession. We believe that God's life-giving word and spirit has conquered the powers of sin and death 
and therefore also of irreconciliation and hatred, bitterness and enmity, that God's life-giving word and spirit will enable the church to live in a new obedience, which can open new possibilities of life for society and the world. To the one and only God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be the honor and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. God saves us in so many ways over and over again. In gratitude for God's great saving love, let us share what we have for the sake of God's work. Let us worship God with this morning's offering. May our gifts be part of your saving work here in our community and around the world. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Please be seated. We've come to the time in the service where we thank you. Come to the time in the service where we pray together. It's a little discombobulated there, but got my phone and in a moment I will have the Zoom chat in front of me. So uh, if you have something you'd like us to pray about, slip up a hand or place it in the Zoom chat. Oh, hang on a sec, technical problems on my phone of all things. have you slip up a hand i will uh call on you you can share your request after each one i will say god in your mercy hear our prayer if you are on zoom you can place a prayer request in the chat and i will see it here uh and the first one already to think about maui and the people of lahaina god we are Devastated by the devastation, horrified by the horror and destruction in Lahaina. Pray for all those who are grieving, all those who are traumatized, all those trying to pick up the pieces today. Speed resources for relief and building. Impart your healing and your peace 
God, in your mercy. People of God, for what else do we pray this morning? Yes. Good news. So a few weeks back, we prayed for a friend who was facing a cancer diagnosis, and they've determined that neither uh, radiation nor chemo are needed, but other treatment, and it sounds like very good news. God, we give you thanks for this outcome. We pray your continued presence and peace for the journey of healing ahead. God, in your mercy. People of God, for what else do we pray? Yes. Listen to my voice. <laughs> I want to thank you all for your thoughts and prayers. Obviously, the procedure went very well. It's supposed to last six months. Hopefully, it'll last longer with you know speech therapy and stuff. And if not, then I'll just do another procedure because it, as icky and as it sounded, it, it worked, and I don't care. <laughs> but thank you very much. And I'm not going to sing in the choir, but. I'm talking. Thank God. We do thank you, God, for healing and recovery. The sound of Sue's voice be with her. May her joy be multiplied. May she know that she is loved and precious in your sight. God, in your mercy. Behind me. Chris, hi. hi. So I have uh, two related things. One might be fairly obvious from those of you who saw me uh, with the uh, offering plates. Uh, I sprained my ankle pretty badly about 10 days ago, and um, it looks like everything is going to work out. It's just going to work out very gradually. So prayers for patience with that uh, for me and for the family, because this kind of changes everything that goes on in the family. Um, and thanks for the medical care, uh, the amazing uh, care for my family that I've had through all of this, uh, from calling my wife from a landing on stairs at work, saying, I messed up my ankle and you need to come get me, um, down to something that some of you have been ushers may have noticed this morning, that the ushers coordinated among themselves so that I would not have to go down the stairs to hand out and receive back the plates, uh, just another way that this church gives grace to those who are um, in need of it. It's like a parable of the kingdom. Imagine, just, listen, the kingdom of God is like a church where one of the ushers had a sprained ankle and the others in love accommodated him. Yeah, God, thank you for that glimpse of your love and work in your people. We pray for healing and strength for Chris and for his family, that you would uh, speed recovery and grant all the needed patience in the meantime. God, in your mercy. Kathy Pitek would like to thank all of you for your prayers for her bonus daughter, Lisa. She's doing so much better and has been getting out with her friends and family. We are so blessed for all of your love and support. God, we thank you for saints who have persevered in prayer, holding Lisa in your light and love as we continue to do so. May blessing be poured out in abundance. God, in your mercy. God, we pray for this friend of Eileen's grieving the death of her husband and for all 
whose lives feel diminished and less because he won't be in them anymore. May you be a great comforter and source of help, nearer than breath. God, in your mercy. Yes, Sid. Yes. 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 Uh, PCUSA disaster assistance. First of all, let me just put in a plug. People always are moved, and rightly so, when there is a disaster to give. But somebody has to have the, the infrastructure in place so that the giving can get to the people who need it. That's why your support of the PCUSA through your support of this church is so important. That said, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance is already on the ground in Maui. And if you go to their website, if you want to give directly, that is an opportunity to do that. God, we thank you that we're a connectional church, that we know people who know people who can help right now today, and that we have the opportunity to resource them and back them up. Move us to be part of your answer to the cries of this world. God, in your mercy. Right. Uh, a minister, a member of the Presbytery, uh, Reverend Tilly Chase, who was the pastor at Olivet for a while, uh, has, has recently gone on hospice with brain cancer. Gracious God, we pray for Reverend Chase entering hospice care. We thank you for a faithful ministry that has directly impacted and blessed us through the many members we cherish who came to us from all of that. We pray that in these days, your spirit would enfold and embrace that you would be all the help and hope and comfort that is needed. God, in your mercy. Oh, yeah. You want the mic? Uh, a prayer for the people at the senior centers, not only in the area, but all around. Very helpful. Gracious God, we pray for all those in senior centers, retirement facilities, and nursing homes. We know that that can be uh, a lonely and challenging time in life. We ask that you would be the God of all comfort, that you would be so near making lives rich and fulfilling. May we remember to visit those whom are not directly in front of us, rejoicing in our connection, our shared connection to the body of Christ. God, in your mercy. Alex. God, we pray for this family. In that phase of life where your children are old enough to go out and make their own mistakes, and how that calls for a different kind of love and a different kind of relationship than what feels familiar and what used to work. Be near with wisdom, with love, with understanding, with the fullness of grace. God, in your mercy. Yes. Come on. Sorry. God, for every place, war-torn and brutalized, the ones on the front page, 
and the ones in the footnotes. You have promised a world of justice and peace. Speed it. Show us how to speed it and move us to live in ways that make your will for the world visible and believable to those around us. May you comfort and defend all in harm's way until the world is well. Trusting in your love and mercy. We pray together now in the words that Jesus taught our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
friends, as we go from this time of worship, may God give you the grace to always remember you belong to God. Because you belong to God, you belong to the people around you, and all those who belong to Christ's church. Because you belong to God, there's work waiting for you in the world. Because you belong to God, you are blessed and you will be a blessing. So go now, and as you go, may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace now and always. Amen.